Good morning, everybody. Pleased to uh, call uh, the uh, committee into order. And uh, I'm pleased that we're joined today by uh, a distinguished panel of witnesses to uh, examine the important issue of biodiversity loss. Dr. Leah Gerber, uh, Ed Sullivan, Andy Treehorn, hope I got that right, Andy, and John Schmidt. And we uh, welcome you all to the Environment and Public uh, Works Committee. I uh, just want to begin by saying that I appreciate that you come to us from across the length and breadth of our great country. And that is important because biodiversity loss is a challenge that transcends geographical boundaries and <laughs> state lines. Across our country's forests, our, our grasslands, our deserts, our rivers and oceans, and all around the world, the, uh, the ecosystem that supports all life uh, are threatened by heat waves, by intense storms, by wildfires, and more. At the same time, wildlife must contend with invasive species, including pests and diseases that we hear about regularly. The more species each ecosystem can sustain, in other words, the greater the biodiversity in each, the greater resilience those ecosystems have to the threats I've just described. And yet around the world, biodiversity is declining faster now than any other time in human history. Let me say that again. Around the world, biodiversity is declining faster now than at any other time in human history. A, cl a changing climate, a habitat loss, loss the, the spread of invasive species in our increasingly connected world, and pollution have all contributed to this decline. For example, the, the ocean absorbs almost a third of the carbon dioxide emitted into our atmosphere every year, a third. The carbon dioxide turns into acid in the ocean, threatening species at the, ba the base of the ocean food web. That impact on the food web is profound, affecting everything from fish to uh, one of our most beloved species in Delaware, a little bird called the, the red knot. The same uh, carbon dioxide contributes to global warming, which is causing sea level rise. As the seas rise, they threaten the red knot's coastal habitat, making the iconic and threatened species even more vulnerable. With the limited food resources and distinguished uh, habitat and diminishing, excuse me, diminishing habitat, the incredible 19,000 mile round trip migration that red knots make each year, I mean, think of that, 19,000 miles. They're, not, they're about the size of this uh, center capital, about the size of uh, this uh, end of my, my hammer. Uh, and, uh, but each year they make this uh, migration and it's become uh, more difficult, not easier. And it's a migration that threatens their long-term survival. But the remarkable, rather, but the, the, the impact of diversity, biodiversity loss, extends far beyond this remarkable species going extinct. It also impacts each and every one of us. How, you might ask. Well, first of all, biodiversity is directly linked to human health. The loss of biodiversity and ecosystem resilience is making animals more susceptible to disease, a particularly troubling development since the vast majority of emerging diseases in people, including potential pandemics, originate in wildlife. We're all too familiar with the consequences of these zoonotic diseases. COVID-19 is one of them. Noting this threat and many others, the World Economic Forum has named biodiversity loss among the top three risks to humanity in terms of impact, along with the weapons of mass destruction and climate action failure. One sector at particular risk is agriculture, which is, of course, critical for global food security and indeed for our very lives. Agriculture is the number one industry in my home state of Delaware, as it is for many of our colleagues on this committee. Our agriculture and food systems cannot exist without healthy soils, soils plant pollination, and pest control, all of which are linked to biodiversity. We simply cannot produce food without the birds, without the bees, and even the lowly earthworms and healthy soil bacteria. If we fail them, we ultimately fail ourselves. Though the current state of biodiversity decline paints a bleak picture for the future, uh, there's reason for hope. If we take action, we can stem biodiversity loss and prevent the harm that comes with it. This is an issue on which our committee has a bipartisan 
record of success, a record of which all of us, all of us can be proud. Last Congress, we enacted into law both the WILD Act and the ACE Act, both of which reauthorized important programs to conserve wildlife and habitat at home and abroad. We also included the first ever wildlife crossings safety section in a highway bill, which would address the problems of habitat fragmentation. As chairman, I hope that we can build on that record this Congress, and I'm eager to work with all of our members on both sides of the aisle to do so. We must also ensure that the federal budget provides robust funding for wildlife protection. We know that our conservation laws work best for both wildlife and people when the agencies responsible for implementing them have the resources that they need to do their jobs effectively. What I've described is a moral and a practical imperative. And like so many of the issues before our committee, this is a challenge we all face and one that we can resolve together. It is no overstatement to say that our lives and our livelihood and those of our children hang in the balance. And with that, I'm pleased to recognize for her comments our ranking member, Sir Shelley Capito, great state of West Virginia, the Mountain State, and uh, for her opening statement before we hear from our witnesses. Senator thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for calling today's uh, hearing. I also want to thank our witnesses for joining us and look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Our nation is an our nation, as the chairman has said, is abundant with natural beauty, and the chairman and I agree wholeheartedly about the importance of conservation. It is essential that we preserve our public lands and our ecosystems while ensuring access to outdoor recreation. The committee has a history of passing bipartisan legislation aimed at conserving wildlife and wildlife habitat. Just last year, and the, the chairman spoke about this, this committee passed the America's Conservation Enhancement Act, which President Trump signed into law in October. Included in the ACE Act was the, was the Chesapeake Watershed Investment for Landscape Defense, Chesapeake Wild Act, which created a new $15 million grant program within the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to support habitat restoration in the Bay Area. As a West Virginian and as a, someone from Delaware, this is important to both of us. The Chesapeake Wild Act, the first federal wildlife conservation grant tailored to benefiting species in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, has bolstered our state's growing outdoor recreation industry. This important fish and wildlife program protects vital ecosystems, while also advancing our outdoor industry by supporting populations of birds, fish, and mammals prized by our outdoorsmen, sportsmen, and fishermen. And we all know West Virginia's $9 billion outdoor recreation industry, which supports 91,000 jobs in our state, is good for the soul and good for the economy. Our anglers and sportsmen, in turn, find conservation through Pittman-Robertson Act pro programs backed by the federal excise taxes on ammunition and fishing tackle. This creates a virtuous cycle improvements to our national heritage, encourages more people, including sportsmen, to get out and enjoy the great outdoors, leading to more investment in conservation. Enhanced biodiversity from this cycle also benefits other sectors, such as agriculture, by supporting species that benefit mankind in more direct ways, such as pollinators or predators that eat pests. Beyond our committee, the Great American Outdoors Act, which I co-sponsored, was enacted last Congress and will provide investments in our public lands and to, to address their maintenance backlogs. These investments will yield benefits for ecosystems and free up other tax dollars otherwise spent by the National Park Service, the Forest Service, and other federal public agencies on addressing the federal maintenance to address priorities such as wildlife conservation. West Virginia is known for being wild and wonderful, and our state is blessed with abundant natural resources from forests to mountains to rivers and to lakes. To showcase our state's natural beauty, I, I worked to redesignate the New River Gorge National River to become a new national park and preserve. Working with local leaders, our hunters and fishermen, economic development folks, and small business owners, we were able to craft a bill that gives the New River Gorge the recognition it deserves while preserving historic hunting and fishing rights. I'm proud to say that President Trump signed that bill into law last year, and I'm also thrilled in to be sharing this part of almost heaven with the rest of the world for generations to come. 
Biodiversity is intrinsic to the natural beauty of our nation, and habitat conservation is key to healthy biodiverse ecosystems. Two weeks ago, the Biden administration issued the, quote, Conserving and Restoring America the Beautiful Report, which intended to outline steps towards President Biden's goal of conserving at least 30 percent of our lands and waters by 2030, commonly referred to as 30 by 30. However, the 24-page document included very few details as to how we can achieve President Biden's ambitious goal. While a number of the core principles, including voluntary and locally-led approaches to conservationism outlined in the plan, are bipartisan in nature, I do have a number of concerns. For instance, the report does not even define conservation, nor does it specify what lands should be included under that program. These questions need to be answered. I look forward to continuing to work with the, regist- with the administration in a bipartisan way on these and other issues, but my lasting and meaningful solutions to addressing biodiversity must come from legislation. Today, I look forward to our discussion on, on con- consensus-driven solutions to these challenges. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. Thanks very, thanks, uh, very much, uh, Senator mm-hmm. Capito. We have, uh, I think, four witnesses joining us today. The first is going to be uh, uh, introduced to us by Senator Kelly from Arizona. Senator Kelly, the show is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you for holding today's hearing on the biodiversity challenges we're facing in the United States and across the world. As you noted, animal, insect, and plant species are declining at rates we've never seen before tens to hundreds of times higher than the average background level spanning the past 10 million years. Scientists estimate that nearly one-third of the species in the United States are close to extinction. These are commonly known species, like polar bears and bumblebees. In Arizona, we could lose wildlife like the Sonoran pronghorn antelope and the desert tortoise, to name just a couple. Today's hearing will focus on this alarming trend, and I'm grateful that the committee tapped one of the world's leading experts to testify on this issue, Dr. Leah Gerber. Dr. Gerber is a professor of conservation science at Arizona State University's School of Life Sciences. She's also the founding director of ASU's Center for Biodiversity Outcomes. Dr. Gerber is the lead author on the United Nations report issued in 2019 that was a wake-up call to the world that extinction rates are accelerating. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing Dr. Gerber's testimony, and thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Senator Kelly, and uh, welcome, Dr. Gerber, and uh, you are now recognized for your statement. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak with you today about the biodiversity crisis. I'm Dr. Leah Gerber, professor in the School of Life Sciences and founding director of the Center for Biodiversity Outcomes at Arizona State University. I was the lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Global Assessment, which provided the most comprehensive evaluation of the status of biodiversity and nature's contribution to people in the US and globally. More species of plants and animals are threatened with extinction now than any other time in human history. 25% of all species, including 40% of amphibians, and 30% of marine mammals are threatened with extinction. And we're not talking about just extinction, we're talking about the general decline of nature. Compared to the 1970s, there are 3 billion fewer birds in North America for people to enjoy, and coral reefs have shrunk by half of their original extent. The The consequences of the decline of nature aren't restricted to wildlife. They extend to people. Nearly 80% of the 18 categories of nature's contributions to people have declined. These ecosystem services provided by biodiversity include things like nutrient cycling, carbon sequestration, pollination, and agricultural productivity. 
Protecting biodiversity ensures the resilience of agriculture as it intensifies to meet growing demands for food production. And food security depends on healthy pollinator populations. Diverse and abundant populations of bees are associated with higher rates of production in America's crop species. Biodiversity is the foundation of our economy and well being, yet it is declining at unprecedented rates. The causes of the biodiversity crisis are well known habitat loss, overexploitation, climate change, pollution, and invasive species. Rapid climate change, for example, influences species' ability to adapt, contributing to biodiversity loss. At present, our main challenge is not trying to figure out what's wrong, it's about deciding to take action to address the problem. The science is clear about the biodiversity crisis, and we have options for solutions. We can start by looking to experience to figure out what works to conserve biodiversity. Congress could consider expanding federal investment in habitat restoration, climate adaptation, and habitat connectivity programs. Congress should also provide robust funding for our nation's wildlife protection laws. These laws work best when the agencies responsible for implementing them have adequate resources. My own work has shown that a return on investment approach to prioritize threatened species recovery actions can help save more species from extinction. Innovative financing and financial markets for biodiversity are promising approaches to measure and value biodiversity. An institutional structure is needed to facilitate corporate disclosure on biodiversity impacts and dependencies and to report progress towards the sustainable development goals. By acknowledging that biodiversity is the foundation of social and economic systems, we can begin to mainstream the value of biodiversity. Congress can help lead the way by providing direction on this solution. Building bridges between government and non-governmental sectors will promote the growing sense of corporate responsibility that is rapidly emerging. For example, I've worked with Bayer to develop a pesticide risk assessment framework that allows sustainable agriculture while ensuring the protection of endangered species. A national biodiversity strategy for the U.S. would focus and coordinate government response to the biodiversity crisis. While some US agencies are responsible to ensure the persistence of biodiversity as part of their mission, many agencies impact biodiversity and can play a significant role in its protection. We could also reestablish a leadership role in international conservation from issues like wildlife trafficking to mitigating plastic pollution in our oceans. We need an inclusive process that brings people together to solve our nation's biodiversity challenge. A long history of discrimination has led to clear patterns of injustice and inequity in our access to nature. Committing to building a diverse workforce makes the science and the scientists better prepared to address, address the growing challenges to biodiversity. We are at a crossroads and the signs are clear which direction we should take. This is the time for Senate and Congress to listen to the science build on our nation's conservation history and take action for biodiversity and ultimately for humanity. Thank you. Dr. Gerber, thank you very much. ASU, right? Yes. My wife's a graduate of ASU. Wonderful. The other ASU, Appala uh -oh. Appalachian State University. Oh, okay. <laughs> we were out in the Redwood City, California on recess a week ago visiting a bunch of uh, technology companies out there. And we stayed at a uh, uh, Marriott Hotel. And we're down in the, the breakfast area. They've got it found a quiet place so I could do a Zoom call and uh, a teleconference call. And all these athletes, women athletes, about 25 of them came in from ASU and filled up the, the dining room and just were full of energy and talking and everything. My wife went over and said to them that she was a graduate of ASU. She said, my husband's over there trying to do the Zoom call. And believe it or not, they stopped talking. They could not have been nicer. And uh, we we're just very impressed with their team discipline. So uh, ASU, uh, welcome. Thank aboard. you. Yeah. Our next witness is, uh, is Ed Sullivan. And uh, uh, Ed Sullivan, uh, just a little bit of background. Ed Sullivan 
As some of you may recall, worked as a journalist before hosting variety shows in the 1930s and 1940s. He eventually became host of The Ed Sullivan Show, the longest-running TV variety program in history, which featured acts like the Supremes, like the Beatles, uh, Jerry Lewis, Elvis Presley, among legions of others. All right, I'm kidding. Uh, but we do have a really big shoe today. And kidding again, but in all serious, we're glad to have the real Ed Sullivan. This is Edmund Sullivan here with us today. The, uh, the original Ed Sullivan has passed on, but his memory lingers on Wikipedia. And if you want to have a good time, check out Ed Sullivan on Wikipedia. And you can see the Beatles as kids, almost, and Elvis Presley at the age of about 20. It is just a hoot. Just great. But um, the real uh, Ed Sullivan is also Edmund Sullivan. And Mr. Sullivan is the uh, executive officer of the Santa Clara Valley Habitat Agency. He has over 25 years of experience in habitat conservation planning, natural resource management, and land use planning. Mr. Sullivan, we thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. And uh, you may begin when you are ready. Take it away. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Carper, Ranking Manor, uh, Member, um, Capito. Yeah, and, and just let me uh, just say for the record, I know it's 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 Capito. At the end Capito. Of the yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. My uh, my apologies. Yep. That's okay. We'll yep. practice it later. <laughs> thank you. And uh, sure, absolutely. And and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and thank you for your leadership. I hope my testimony will prove to be a catalyst into further exploration of benefits and lessons learned from large-scale multi-agency habitat conservation plans, which are effective solutions to stemming biodiversity loss while facilitating economic development. In thinking about the future of habitat conservation planning, it is important to appreciate their legacy through the Endangered Species Act, HC, uh, through the Endangered Species Act, HCP program, endangered species conservation has evolved considerably and several lessons can be gleaned from this development. Most notably that with foresight planning and investment, economic development and biodiversity are not mutually exclusive. In assessing these pioneer arrangements, it is important to consider not only the efficiency of their formation and implementation processes, but also their effectiveness in advancing valuable conservation goals. Landscape scale HCPs are attempting to implement sustainable development principles of permitting economic development while at the same time protecting wildlife habitat and diversity, as well as sequestering carbon. The integration of environment and development will lead to improved living standards for all, better protected and managed ecosystems, and a safer, more prosperous future. Protected areas are the backbone of global biodiversity conservation. Land conservation at the ecosystem scale is a key driver for achieving that objective, and regional HCPs are one of the best mechanisms available, capable of implementing that objective. With the effects of climate change, regional HCPs and other similar conservation efforts are leading a paradigm shift in reserve design and function by identifying and protecting biodiversity spots, hotspots in those areas least likely to undergo rapid climate-induced changes. Large-scale HCPs are wired for tackling climate change since we are ecosystem-focused intent on building resiliency replication into the landscape, establishing wildlife linkages, and protecting climate refugia. Landscape scale HCPs recognize threats to biodiversity and fragmented landscapes and are positioned to help mitigate these threats by conserving large habitat patch areas linked to one another through protected wildlife corridors. HCPs have the capacity to stem biodiversity loss because it is our core mission. We also are financial, we also have financial sustainability necessary to succeed. Endowment funding focused on in perpetuity land management and monitoring. And we're focused on building collaborative partnerships between all levels of government, NGOs, and private landowners. Another important point is the adaptive management driven implementation approach that HCPs 
take as well as science-centered land conservation decision making uh, focused on protecting biodiversity hotspots. I hope my testimony presents a wide range of illustrative actions for sustainability and pathways for achieving them across and between sectors. I believe it highlights the importance of adopting integrated management and cross sectoral approaches like regional landscape scale HCPs that consider the trade offs of necessary infrastructure development and biodiversity conservation. Will striking these balances require substantial financial investment? Yes, but not nearly as much as losing the $125 trillion worth of ecosystem services that experts estimate nature provides to the planet every year. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, thank you very, very much. Senator Capito, I, before I, I recognize you to introduce uh, Andy Treherne. I'm, my staff and I were rack, racking our brains going back in time to earlier, going back to the original Ed Sullivan show when the Beatles were on. We're trying to think of a Beatles song that would actually uh, be pertinent to uh, the, the, the subject of today's hearing. The best we could come up with was I Am the Walrus, which is not too bad, not too bad. Uh, Senator Capito, Capito, <laughs> I, we recognize you again to introduce our, our next witness, Andy Treharn. I hope I've got that right, Andy. Senator Capito, Capito. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Carper. Um, I, you don't get the mispronunciation, but that's all right. I'm used to it. It's, it doesn't offend me. Um, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, introduce uh, our witness, Mr. Andy Treharn. Uh, and I'm glad you could join us today. He drove up from Richmond, he said. He joined this uh, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation in 2011 as the organization's lead on sportsman's policy issues throughout the Western United States and currently serves at CSF's Senior Director for External Affairs. Prior to his role, he served as policy director for the House Republicans in the Colorado General Assembly, where he helped steer a 33-member uh, caucus through agenda development, policy and budget analysis, and regulatory monitoring. He's also an alumnus of Capitol Hill, having served as a legislative aide for former Senator Wayne Allard. So a warm welcome back to the Hill, Mr. Treharn. As someone who has dedicated his life to hunting, wildlife, and conservation issues, Mr. Treharn understands the essential role the sportsmen have in preserving our national, natural environment. His wealth of experience on these issues will be of good benefit to the hearing today. We're happy to have you here and look forward to your testimony. Mr. Treharn. Right. Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify on one of the most pressing conservation challenges facing our nation biodiversity loss. My name is Andy Treharn, and as Senator Capito said, I serve as the Senior Director of External Affairs for CSF, the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation. Established in 1989, CSF works with the Congressional Sportsman's Caucus, the largest, most active bipartisan caucus on Capitol Hill. Before discussing modern day challenges and solutions for addressing biodiversity, it is important to take a moment to put things into historical perspective. Over 80 years ago, the hunting community led the charge to establish excise taxes on firearms and ammunition directed speci specifically to conservation purposes. With the subsequent enactment of similar excise taxes generated by anglers, boaters, and archery enthusiasts, revenue from sportsmen's licenses is permanently linked to conservation, laying the foundation for what is now the unique American system of conservation funding. A user pays public benefits program that is the financial backbone of conservation in our country. Totaling nearly $1.1 billion for FY21, plus millions of dollars annually in license and permit fees, these ongoing investments benefit the American public in a variety of ways, ranging from recreational access to increased wildlife populations to wetland conservation that filters our water and improves our soil quality. Despite the unparalleled success of the user pays public benefits system, America continues to experience challenges for biodiversity conservation. It is critical that we take steps to invest in 21st century funding mechanisms to meet the challenges before us today. In doing so, we must also maintain the integrity of existing funding mechanisms, often generated by sportsmen and women, that contribute to biodiversity conservation. 
While much of the focus recently has been on declining biodiversity, our community continues to contribute positive results for fish and wildlife. For example, North American waterfowl populations have increased by 56% since 1970, a nod to highly successful conservation programs such as the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, NACA, and federal and state duck stamps. We thank the committee for their work to reauthorize NACA through the America's Conservation Enhancement, or ACE Act, last year. Yet, we still face significant challenges. Forest birds and grassland birds lack a funding source such as NACA or duck stamps. Consequently, these bird populations have declined roughly 30% during the same time waterfowl populations increased significantly. However, declines in biodiversity are not limited to bird populations. In 2000, Congress recognized this challenge and created a new sub-account within the Pittman-Robertson Act known as the Wildlife Conservation and Restoration Program, which requires states to develop federally approved State Wildlife Action Plan, or SWAP. However, Congress currently provides approximately only 5% of the funding needed to implement these plans that are essentially roadmaps for biodiversity. Congress has the ability to address this disparity by pursuing solutions, such as the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, that provides states with the resources necessary to implement these plans that states have been crafting at Congress's request. We also have opportunities to support biodiversity by investing in solutions that support wildlife movement. As land use changes disrupt historic landscapes and limit the movement of enough individuals within a species population, Many of these species' ability to migrate to habitat conditions that are capable of meeting their resource needs becomes impaired. We applaud the committee for its bipartisan work last Congress in the development of the ATIA, uh, specifically select Section 1125, that would address the approximately 2 million wildlife vehicle collisions annually while enhancing habitat connectivity through existing programs. There are similar opportunities to to support aquatic resource conservation through programs like the Forest Service's Aquatic Organism Passage Program and NOAA's Habitat Restoration Grants. Supporting programs that are built on collaborative conservation is also needed. Given that many of our most significant biodiversity and species conservation opportunities are found on privately owned lands, we believe there are opportunities to better incentivize landowners to participate in voluntary programs such as those authorized and funded through the Farm Bill's conservation title, joint ventures, the Partners for Fish and Wildlife program, among others. Newer programs such as Utah's Waterstead Restoration Initiative and the Southeast Deer Partnership are also generating positive results. In summary, CSF thanks the committee for holding a hearing on this important issue for the and for the opportunity to testify. Increasing efforts to address biodiversity loss is not only beneficial for fish, wildlife, and plants, but is also good for the American economy, sportsmen and women, rural com and rural communities. CSF encourages the continued support for existing programs that play a role in addressing these challenges, as well as support for new programs such as the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the record, how do you pronounce your last name, Andy? Uh, that's a complicated question. Come on, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, my parents always told me that it is Treharn, uh, but every time I meet somebody from Southern England or Wales, they tell me it's pronounced Treharn. So ah, okay. I think my parents are probably incorrect. All right. They, they usually know best. Oh, we're delighted that you're here. Thanks so much. You, did you, did I understand Senator Capito said you had worked uh, for a uh, uh, senator from Colorado, uh, Wayne Allard? Yes, Mr. Chairman. My recollection, he was a vet veterinarian, still is, right? Correct. He would, he would say to me, Senator Capito, that he takes care of, of uh, the Lord's critters on this planet. That's what he said. All right. Well, welcome. You work for a good guy. Um, next, uh, I think we're going to recognize Senator Capito again. And uh, I think she's uh, going to introduce me to our final witness, John, Sh John Schmidt. Is it John Schmidt from? John, John Schmidt. John mm -hmm. Schmidt from, uh, is he from West Virginia or Richmond? Elkins. Well, because my guy, where my mom was born. Oh. It just doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> We're probably related. <laughs> might be, might be. Well, I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce my friend, John Schmidt. We've worked together for the last several decades, actually. 
He currently serves as the, uh, on the board of directors of Partnerscapes, an organization with agencies, nonprofit organizations, and, po and policymakers to collaborate on conservation projects through voluntary incentive-based public and private programs. He recently joined the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program to in control invasive species and promote pollinator habitat on his own land. John, whose background is in biology, recently finished a lengthy uh, tenure at U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, at, at, uh, be, having worked for the agency for 32 years in the Elkins, West Virginia field office. In that capacity, he worked closely with my team on conservation and permitting issues. It's always a pleasure having West Virginians testify before the committee. And we are very, both very glad that we have our visitor center up in the Canaan Valley uh, re refuge uh, that U.S. Fish and Wildlife helped us um, initiate and, and also um, cut the ribbon on. It's a beautiful spot. John's important work with Partnerscapes and the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program shows he understands the importance of landowner input uh, in effective conservation policies. So I look forward to hearing your testimony, John, and thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure to speak to you, and I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Carper and you, Senator Capito, ranking member, and the other senators and their staff for uh, making this possible today. Um, thank, thank you for, uh, specifically today, I'd like to speak on the benefits of restoring uh, the Fish and Wildlife Services Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program and the great work it has done nationwide to keep land, private landowners working on their land and benefiting a multitude of native species. I've included three handouts today to provide further information. I'm privileged to represent West Virginia on the Partnerscapes Board of Directors. Partnerscapes is a national organization that connects private landowners with partner organizations to improve conservation efforts. The organization is led by landowners who want to conserve and sustain the land for their families and their communities, as well as the natural resources and wildlife that inhabit their respective landscapes. What we, hear from what we hear time and time again is that more government programs need to be like the Partners Program. Partnerships are effective in bringing landowners and agencies together for a common purpose. What each party, when each party has skin in the game, joint projects are more successful. This is no different than with our Partners Projects. Initially, in West Virginia, our Partners Program got off to a slow start as it offered, uh, mainly offered technical support and funding to restore wetlands. Well, as you can imagine, in, a, in the mountain state, most of our landowners preferred their already uh, drained wetlands to stay that way so they could grow crops. Um, we picked up speed, however, and projects and acres and miles of habitat when we began offering technical assistance to build fences to help keep cattle out of streams and forests. And we provided alternative water sources so the cows didn't need to get into the streams, which improved far, uh, their health and gain, weight gains. The landowners um, also uh, ended up with uh, better grazing management and taxpayers ended up with cleaner water, higher species diversity, and, and, um, and so on. So, the Partners Program has two primary goals, one of which is to imp uh, imp improve endangered species, habitat, and populations. The other is to assist the National Wildlife Refuge with their mission. And these, uh, these two uh, priorities often overlap. Fast forward to my own experience in, 19, uh, in, in, in this year, uh, in 2021, my wife and I are fortunate to own a work, some working forest land in Randolph County, not too far from Elkins. We purchased the land in 2018 and manage it for a multitude of plant and animal species. The majority of the forest supports a healthy stand of mature red oak, white oak, maple, and poplar. Unfortunately, we have about 10 acres that is where a, of young forest that the, the understory is dominated by a number of invasive shrub species like bar, Japanese barberry, autumn olive, tartarian honeysuckle, and of course, multiflora rose. Uh, these invasives have crowded out and prevented the recruitment of native trees and shrubs and uh, has ruined or has diminished the biodiversity on that, that 10 acres. 
So what do you do? Well, I, uh, of course, I called my former colleagues at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the USDA to see if their programs could assist me as they have assisted countless West Virginians uh, with eliminating the, the threat to my forest health from these invasives. While we were meeting on site, the agency folks also pointed out the benefit of adding um, some pollinator habitat. And, by, and we created, uh, we're in the process of creating a one acre uh, plot of uh, wildflowers and other forbs to benefit pollinators such as bees and moths and things like that. Um, the addition will also, this addition will also benefit a multitude of game and non-game species and improve species diversity on my land. So the Partners Program in West Virginia has restored the following uh, upland acres and, uh, that have been restored and enhanced nearly 30,000 acres, wetland acres restored and enhanced 733 acres, stream miles restored and enhanced 138 miles, a lot of that in the upper Potomac. Stream miles reopened to fish passage, 491. That is from three dams removed on the West Fork River. What next? To date, the partners, uh, West, the West Virginia partners construction crews have completed over 2 million feet of livestock exclusion fence. The demand remains strong and should continue for the future. Demand for in-stream restoration to restore fish and aquatic passage remains high. Not only will this increase population resilience in the face of a changing climate, it will prevent stream bank erosion, which adversely affects water quality and, and exacerbates downstream flooding. Several low head dams in West Virginia are utilized in conjunction with water intakes for municipal water sources. Many of these systems now need costly repair and key components are difficult to replace. The aging infrastructure creates an imminent risk to communities across the state. New technology exists for water intake structures that are more reliable and boost capacity without the need for expensive and dangerous dams. Removing the Heartland Dam in Clarksburg, for example, would, would create savings for the water board and its ratepayers. It would, in, more importantly, promote an, a healthy and diverse natural flowing ecosystem and expand local business opportunities by restoring safe access to river recreation. 75% of fish and wildlife species depend on private land for their survival. With 2.2 million square miles of land in private ownership, conserving and enhancing habitat for migratory birds, endangered species, and other tr federal trust species, as well as the natural infrastructure, is the only way possible, is only possible through partnerships with private landowners. The Partners Program is a model for bringing private landowners and government agencies and funding together to solve shared concerns. Thank you. Mr. Schmidt, uh, thank you very much. Give our best to Elkins. And, uh, I will, sir. I, uh, I think I'll uh, start off by asking maybe the first question of Dr. Gerber. Dr. Gerber, are you still with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gerber, your testimony mentions the, uh, the impacts of climate change and biodiversity decline, and references an in-depth article entitled Climate Change and Ecosystems, uh, Threats, Opportunities, and Solutions. I'm interested, we're interested in learning more about the linkages between climate change and biodiversity loss, particularly with respect to solutions. Could you take a shot at that question, please? Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, for the question. Um, so climate change, as, as um, many of you know, um, has impacts on both the abundance and distribution of biodiversity. Many species um, are, uh, we have good evidence that uh, climate change leads to range shifts in species. Species must adapt to the, the warming uh, temperatures and in some cases are unable to adapt. So we're seeing a broad scale shifting of species ranges. Uh, in some cases, species are unable to adapt and we're seeing increased risk of extinction for those species. Um, it, some of the consequences uh, that, that we've seen have to do with, um, uh, you know, for example, uh, ocean warming and ocean acidification are, are uh, great examples of some of those consequences. Uh, we also, for example, recently with the California wildfires have seen 
um, recent uh, frequency and intensity of these extreme uh, events uh, caused by climate change. Um, so the, the things that climate change in terms of posing a risk can provide us um, with um, it, it, taking effective action includes, um, you know, reducing warming yeah. and this would include um, reducing emissions, uh, food waste, uh, promoting plant-based diets, alternative energy, and reforestation, reforestation, particularly in tropical areas. Uh, we can also begin to mitigate and adapt by establishing wildlife corridors uh, pro to protect networks of habitat and in urban landscapes to prevent, to establish uh, green spaces. Um, and so, the, and the last thing I want to mention regarding climate change is that um, like many of the comments that have been made throughout today's uh, hearing, uh, climate change not only poses a risk for natural systems, but it also impacts um, biodiversity fundamentally, which indirects influences influences human well-being, uh, specifically uh, our ability to um, provide food, pollination, medicine, flood protection, recreational opportunities, drinking water, clean air. So um, there is a, a, an inextricable link between climate change and biodiversity. All right, Dr. Cooper, thanks uh, very much for your response to that. I have, my next question is for uh, Mr. Sullivan, and then I'm gonna yield to Senator Capito. Um, Mr. Sullivan, you shared some compelling examples today of how uh, habitat uh, conservation plans have improved outcomes for species and uh, efficiency for uh, infrastructure projects. Um, this is, uh, I'm always looking for win-win situations. This appears to be a real win-win uh, situation. Habitat uh, conservation planning is more prevalent, as you know, than it once was. And, uh, but arguably, habitat conservation plans are still an underutilized uh, tool. Just briefly, what do you think are the primary challenges preventing more widespread use of habitat conservation plans? And secondly, how might Congress be able to help address those challenges? Mr. Sure. Sure. sure, thank you, Chairman. Um, so I think the challenges is that they're not necessarily well known as a tool, even sometimes within the, the service itself. It's, um, it's embedded within the Endangered Species Act, the Section 10, and many times there's just not uh, sort of the promotion of them like there should be as as a win-win tool, as you described. I think uh, there's a lack sometimes of funding and staffing for this program at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I do think if there was more funding, uh, uh, in in particular for staff within the regions and, and sort of an effort by uh, the service to kind of market these out to stakeholders, because I do believe they are a, uh, a very positive win-win solution. I mean, there's plenty of examples that were highlighted in my testimony about highway projects and so forth and so on that were, you know, stuck between negotiations between project proponents and the Fish and Wildlife Service and others, but got unstuck because of the, the Section 10 program, which is is about finding a balance and uh, a compromise. Thanks, thanks for uh, your response to that question. Uh, Senator Kaplan, oh, you're please. welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Treharn, um, I wanted to ask you about, I mentioned in my opening statement, President Biden's uh, America the Beautiful Initiative, or 30 by 30, which it sets a goal of conserving 30% of U.S. lands and water by the year 2030. Uh, I was wondering if the outdoor recreation, particularly the hunting and fishing community, was involved in the development of this report. And um, do you think these, you know, if not, uh, what kind of suggestions or what kind of caution flags would you would you be presenting? Thank you, Ranking Member Capito. Uh, the, the answer to your question is uh, really requires a little bit of history. Um, we started to hear about 30 by 30 uh, early in 2019 through state legislative actions. Uh, 
those were particularly concerning uh, for some of the reasons you outlined in your opening remarks. Uh, lack of definition, uh, creating a lot of uncertainty for those in our community. And uh, at that time, uh, we started looking into the 30 by 30 initiative uh, and realized that at its most basic level, there's a lot in common with the conservation work that sportsmen and women do. Uh, however, the devil is in the details. And so uh, the Congressional Sportsmen's Foundation uh, worked with a number of partners uh, that now total nearly 50 NGOs that are part of a group called the Hunt Fish 3030 Coalition. And uh, through that entity, we have been proactively uh, engaged in the administration uh, to make sure that they are aware and, and understand our perspective on conservation, uh, things like the importance of private land, uh, non-regulatory approaches, um, voluntary conservation, uh, the maintaining the integrity of uh, sportsman-driven uh, conservation dollars and revenue. Uh, and really that was, uh, we came to a decision point uh, because uh, you know, with that uncertainty surrounding 30 by 30 and the lack of definition, um, we either could stand on the sidelines and uh, let, let that happen and let others define conservation on behalf of our community. Um, but we decided to come to the table and, and uh, create some space for, for hunters and anglers to talk about how we support conservation uh, and some of the things that we've learned over the last 80 years since we've been doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Very complete answer. I appreciate that. Um, Mr. Schmidt, you, you've mentioned a couple things in your testimony, uh, uh, particularly in, on your own private land ownership, but I know in your capacity at U.S. Fish and Wildlife, you uh, dealt a lot with public, or private land ownership. And as you know, as West Virginians, this is a uh, very, uh, very much in our DNA in terms of protecting our own land and making sure that the solutions that we find are, uh, are driven by what what we as private landowners uh, can contribute and, and preserve. So I guess I guess why my point in bringing that up is um, in order to improve the fish and wildlife habitat, you need to have the flexibility, I think, for the landowner. So why would you think that uh, with your uh, partners for fish and wildlife, you you said it needs to it needs to grow would be important in addressing this flexibility issue when you're looking at biodiversity loss? Thanks, Thanks for that question, question Senator Capto. The um, flexibility is important because every landowner has um, different goals and one size doesn't fit all as we found out with just when we were just doing wetland restoration. So we've modified the program nationwide to include invasive species treatment, uh, dam removals, in-stream work, and uh, as well as livestock exclusion and grazing management. I mean, some of the best work we do uh, is actually to put better grazing systems on the land so that the farmer makes more money, but the species diversity remains intact. And matter of fact, it often improves when it comes to grassland species. You yeah. know, but landowners themselves, you know, everybody's got to, you know, they, they want to help. And that's why they've contacted us or the USDA. And but they, it also has to work for them in their bottom line. I mean, they 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 want to pass, you know. In, in some cases, they they want to pass this land on to the next generation, and they want to leave it in good shape. Yeah, I think that's a good okay. point. I think in in some ways, our uh, where we've kind of gotten hung up a little bit on this is uh, a lot of times. I think our local landowners and our folks that have been in the communities for years really are the best stewards of their own properties and and know the best way to move forward. And, and when you start pushing down mandates from Washington and other places that don't fit with, you know, the local um, uh, conservation plan or, or envisionment for your own property, that's where it really starts to, to rub people the wrong way. I know we went, this, we went through this with uh, 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 the wilderness designation several years ago in West Virginia and really ran up against a lot of people at the same time. So um, what impact do you think that um, if we, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, ESAs, if, if there were a, a tidal wave of potential ESA listings around the country, 
What do you think that could mean in terms of uh, economic development, environment, and also for the Fish and Wildlife Service itself? Well, um, for economic development, it could prevent, uh, it could be, it could slow things down because currently the staffing at a lot of our field offices is, is not high enough to meet a de the current demand. So if we had more listings, uh, then we would need more horses to pull the wagon, okay? And um, it's not, we're not seeing that in the budget. And, you know, the, the partners program is kind of like the, the, it's the restoration wing of the endangered species program. And we, these got our endangered species biologists tell us what, where we need to work, and then we do that. And we also work on, you know, precluding the list that need species. So, you know, like for instance, butter, uh, monarch butterflies, that was uh, one that was due to be listed, you know, had a, had a strong potential. And we ended up um, doing enough work with private landowners and highway departments and such that we were able to preclude the need to list that animal. So, you know, it's right now the, the service uh, does not have the horses it needs to pull that wagon that you guys are, you know, if, if we have a regulatory approach, I think we need to, to continue to work with private landowners. Um, you know, I know Partnerscapes is very concerned about 30 for 30 and what does it mean for the reasons you pointed out. And, uh, you know, we're trying to let folks know that there are, there are a lot of private landowners who have already done a lot of good work to conserve habitat, and we want to make sure that is counted. Right. I appreciate it. And thank you. Thanks, uh, Senator Capito. I um, think uh, Senator Ben Cardin from uh, Maryland may have joined us from, uh, from WebEx, my Delmarva buddy. Uh, Senator Cardin, are you there? Well, well thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. And let me thank all of our witnesses. Uh, this has been an incredibly important hearing. Biodiversity is critically important uh, to the Chesapeake Bay, which I know the members of this committee Will not be surprised to hear that I will mention uh, during this hearing. Uh, biodiversity, uh, we have 3,600 different species that live in the Chesapeake Bay. We have over 11,000 miles of coastline on the Chesapeake Bay. And as a result of uh, more severe weather conditions, we've seen a challenge on runoff that has affected the quality uh, of the Chesapeake Bay and its ability to support biodiversity. So we have real challenges. And I, I just really want to, if I could, Dr. Gerber, uh, uh, focus on one of those issues, which is wetlands. We had had some conversation about this. We've lost a lot of wetlands in the Chesapeake Bay through development and through sea level increases. Uh, we have restoration programs. I, I want to mention just two and then get your reaction as to what else we should be doing. Uh, we have uh, reclaimed Poplar Island in the Chesapeake Bay, which was at one time a habitable island which almost totally disappeared. We've done that through an environmental restoration, uh, which includes the use of dredge material to rebuild that island and now supports biodiversity. Uh, it is a wonderful place to visit, but it also served as an economic engine for us being able to keep our channels open in the Chesapeake Bay. The second project I wanna mention uh, is what's happening at Blackwater. Blackwater Wildlife uh, Refuge is one of the great refuges in, in this region, uh, in, located on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, it's lost a lot of its wetlands over the years as a result of sea level rises uh, and other causes. But uh, restoration efforts have been successful where we use dredge material to rebuild wetlands, and it's worked. It just costs some money to do this. It's, uh, to transport the dredge material to Blackwater is a little bit more expensive than putting it someplace else. Poplar Island environmental restorations cost more upfront, but they save us money over a longer period of time. So I just really wanna get your view, how important it is for us to restore islands such as Poplar Island or Blackwater Wildlife Refuge in an effort to have habitat that's critically important for biodiversity. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator Cardin. Cardin. Uh, wonderful work that you're leading in the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay. Uh, I will uh, add that I am um, by no means an expert on this region, but I will add a few comments. I think my overarching comment is that the experience in the Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay 
demonstrates that conservation works and when, when resourced, we can actually see impacts. And I think it also underscores the important, uh, the importance and um, the consequences of taking a collaborative interagency approach to, to working together to achieve these outcomes. And then thirdly, I think um, underscores the importance of funding the programs that, that we strategically, de strategically define as important. Uh, regarding the Chesapeake Bay in particular, um, as, as you discussed, uh, the Bay faces a number of challenges, including excess nutrients, uh, sediment from non-source pollution, invasive species, climate change. Restoration is uh, definitely a, I agree that it is a viable approach to be taken here uh, because it increases the <clears throat> diversity, uh, the population and distribution and diversity of endangered species. It also enhances landscape connectivity and benefits human well-being because, as we've discussed previously, uh, healthy ecosystems, clean water, air, and soil are good for both people and wildlife. Um, I, uh, a number of federal restoration projects uh, led by many federal agencies, including NOAA, EPA, and Fish and Wildlife Service services have restored coastal areas in the Bay that have been impacted by human development, and they have seen the return of wildlife that ha has previously been believed to have been lost. Um, some of the most recognizable restorations in and around the Bay have been those of oyster reefs. I've always been impressed with, with oysters, which are natural filter feeders and can clean water. Um, the, the, the factoid that I like to talk about with oysters is that each adult filters 50 gallons of water per day, uh, providing food and habitat um, for one of the, the region's most valuable fisheries. So I, I thank you and I support the work you're doing in the Chesa Chesapeake Bay. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I would invite members of the committee to, to join me to, to visit Poplar Island and see, it's not far from here, and see firsthand how we've restored biodiversity uh, in reclaiming the Bay. The Army Corps supporting uh, the Mid Bay, which is the next chapter of environmental restoration with dredge material. Uh, it, it's a real success story. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks that's, for the witness. That's, uh, that's great news, Ben. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Gerber, thank you for your closing co uh, comments there. I, uh, I, we've been uh, joined by uh, Senator Whitehouse, Senator Padilla. I think they're both with us on uh, WebEx. Uh, Sheldon, I think you're next. And then uh, uh, Senator Padilla will be af after him, after uh, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, Sheldon, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Carper and I uh, both uh, also sit on the Finance Committee, and I just want to flag for uh, any colleagues who may be interested that as we go through trying to reform our tax code to get rid of some of the crummy ways that it has been used to uh, help special interests at the expense of regular taxpayers, um, if we can help reinforce the advantages for durable conservation easements, I am all in on that and would uh, love to work on that in bipartisan fashion. Um, Mr. Traharn, your testimony talks about protecting river habitat by restoring uh, dams and uh, improving culverts and some of the uh, man-made interruptions of river flow. We are obviously working on this a lot in Rhode Island. We have a lot of small dams. And I've been working for years to try to figure out a solution to um, efficiently allowing states to address the problem of uh, particularly small dams, which in a lot of places aren't really owned by anybody any longer. Um, and you have to uh, go through a process that's not that different from damming the Columbia River to remove a dam on a little local stream or river, and you have to deal with a whole lot of uh, title and liability issues, and there's, we've got to work on a way to, to solve that. I think we have a way to solve that, but we just haven't been able to get it done yet. So I'd like to invite you to um, help us solve the problem of how to remove small and sometimes dangerous uh, usually obsolete uh, dams that obstruct so many of our 
of our important rivers. Are, Are you in for that? that? Pardon me, my microphone wasn't working. Um, absolutely, Senator. And uh, one one thing that I think uh, this committee can take a lot of credit for uh, is the passage of the, the National Fish Habitat Partnerships, uh, which will support the Na National Fish Habitat Action Plan moving forward. Uh, and I think those types of groups would be um, very interested in talking with you and would be happy to connect you with them and uh, see how their mission overlaps with what you're trying to do. Good. This is my long, long lasting frustrations in the Senate. Um, sometimes little things can take a long time to get done. So I look forward to working with you. Uh, Dr. Gerber, um, you were good enough to mention oceans and specifically um, coral reefs. Could you just give us, uh, for the record of the committee, an overview of the biodiversity calamities that are happening in many respects out of our human site uh, in the oceans where we are visitors and not uh, customary inhabitants? And particularly if what is predicted for coral reefs happens, which is that ocean acidification and ocean warming driven by fossil fuel emissions more or less wipes them out what, what that, that does to the pace of biodiversity collapse in the oceans. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for the opportunity to talk about marine systems, which is actually my area of expertise. Uh, regarding the issue of, of climate change in coral reefs, um, we, we see a number of impacts. One is, as you mentioned, uh, the, the uh, coral structures are unable to adapt to um, the increasing temperatures. So what, what we're seeing is widespread bleaching of coral reefs. In addition to uh, the loss of the coral reefs themselves, we're seeing a loss of uh, the structure that provides hot habitat for entire ecosystems of biodiversity. So, um, the other thing that I think is relevant to bring up here is that um, in terms of impacts of climate change on marine systems, we're also seeing impacts of climate change on the extent to which organisms move in the ocean. Uh, with warmer temperatures, uh, we, we see more rapid metabolic processes, and so less movement, for example, between larval stages occurs, and this um, has broad implications for the way we manage the ocean because uh, these marine organs, organisms have adapted to having this life cycle where the larvae live in different areas than the adults, and that provides some resilience uh, to extreme events. So by, uh, by this reduction in, redu reduction in movement patterns, uh, we actually are seeing less resilience in, in marine systems. So in a nutshell, biodiversity in the oceans is a serious problem and it's going to get rapidly worse if coral reefs um, vanish as a, as a uh, piece of the uh, environmental infrastructure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Great. Thanks for helping us remember oceans and uh, thank you, Chairman, very much. Uh, Senator Whitehouse, thank you for helping us remember the oceans as well. Uh, Senator Padilla, I believe, might be next, and uh, Senator Padilla, I think, is joining us on WebEx. Uh, Alex, are you there? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, want to raise a couple of issues and questions with Mr. Sullivan, uh, Little California. Uh, you highlighted, uh, Mr. Sullivan, in your testimony uh, the uh, proposal to create the Western Riverside County National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, in uh, Southern California, a few miles uh, uh, east of uh, Los Angeles. California, as you know, is one of the most biodiverse places in the world with thousands and thousands of species. And as you noted, uh, the proposed refuge would directly protect 147 species, 33 of which are threatened or endangered. This area of uh, Southern California uh, is also in need of sustainable development. 
Uh, it's a densely populated area with uh, uh, inequitable uh, access to nature and open spaces, particularly for working class communities and communities of color. So I'm hoping you can uh, uh, ex expand uh, on your testimony and share with us your thoughts on how the proposed wildlife refuge uh, can help us meet multiple uh, uh, policy priorities here. Number one, help and protect biodiversity uh, of the area, uh, which you know has multiple uh, environmental benefits, uh, all, while also enabling responsible and sustainable development. And third, uh, helping improve uh, uh, not just access to nature and wildlife, but more equitable access to uh, the outdoors. Yes, thank you, Senator, for um, for the questions and the opportunity to um, respond. Yeah, yep. those are great questions. Uh, it's complicated when you're trying to balance all these different um, um, you know, biodiversity versus public access versus where, you know, affordable housing and a lot of the challenges that we face in California and other parts of the country. Uh, I agree with you that sustainable development is the goal and how we plan responsibly is key. Uh, some of the old development models um, haven't haven't worked very well. You know, they were auto centric and 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 focused on um, um, people sprawling out in the landscape and you know so how do we balance all this i think it starts at the local level it it's not the uh, uh, the locals know best on where to define where development can go and yeah. development that is is avoiding those biological hotspots and then identifying those bi biological hotspots and protecting them which is what this uh, proposed refuge refuge designation is proposing uh, the locals and the local scientists and the um, the implementers of the West Riverside HCP have identified this area as important to uh, achieving the objectives of their habitat conservation plan. So the locals have sort of worked with the federal government to identify this area. So I think the way the feds can help is um, by approving this designation and also for increasing funding, funding through the ESA Section 6 program to as assist HCPs across the country protect the nation's biodiversity hotspots. With, uh, with access, that's, uh, you, you know, parts of the refuge could be open to, to the, the public, public. interpretive Inter exhibits and tours uh, can educate visitors on the importance of biodiversity, uh, refuge staff and local biologists could implement and adopt, uh, you know, have a adopt a school program to get kids involved in nature. Residents and school children can help at the refuge, volunteering for habitat restoration and projects and general maintenance. So it's basically trying to empower the community to adopt the refuge and work collaboratively. You know, the refuge doesn't necessarily have to be a place that's off limits to people and how you can kind of integrate the community with the refuge and the refuge with the community. And that's sort of the uh, of the intent of, uh, of sustainable development anyways. And to echo with some of the things that John Schmidt was saying about working with private landowners, we do that all the time here. You know, we work with ranchers and they're an important component of of implementing, uh, you know, a local approach to conservation, and um, and then on the other side, working with local uh, municipalities to okay. encourage them to develop more sustainably. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Much to uh, follow up on. Senator Padilla, great to uh, be with you again a second time today, and thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you on the floor later when we vote. We've been uh, we're joined earlier today by Senator Ernst and. Uh, she serves on a number of committees, as we all do. Uh, we appreciate her very much for stopping by, although she was un un unable to stay uh, till, till we had an opening for questions, but we thank her for coming. Uh, Senator Bozeman, uh, but Senator Bozeman is also here, and uh, he's co-chair of the Senate Caucus on Recycling and an active member of this committee. We appreciate him stopping by. And Senator Kelly, thank uh, Senator Kelly for joining us and in introducing one of our, 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 one of our witnesses. 
I have a couple of questions to go. We, uh, if uh, when I get to the end of these questions, if someone else has joined us either remotely or in person, I'll yield to to that uh, to that senator. That'll be about five or ten minutes from now. The um, uh, a, que a question, if I could, for the entire uh, panel, and uh, the, the, the subject deals with the importance of federal funding. Uh, each of you in your testimony talks about the importance of federal funding for conservation programs, uh, including for the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, uh, for the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, and for implementation of our nation's wildlife protection laws. And again, a question for each of you. And uh, we'll, we'll, the question is, would uh, you each elaborate on the importance of federal funding for wildlife conservation? Second part of the question is, what do we stand to lose when we underfund these programs? Let me repeat that. Would you each elaborate on the importance of federal funding for wildlife conservation? Second half of the question, what do we stand to lose when we underfund these programs? Ms. Gerber, would you like to go ahead? Go first, Dr. Gerber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the opportunity to comment on this, this important issue of funding for conservation, uh, globally, um, we need best estimates indicate that we need approximately $76 billion to protect biodiversity. At present, this is less than 0.01% of the annual GDP. In the U.S., the annual cost for recovering endangered species that we've estimated from reviewing of recovery plans is approximately $1.2 billion per year. At present, approximately 20%, only 20% is allocated to the agencies for uh, engaging in recovery planning efforts. Now, just for context, this 20% this is approximately 1% of the annual cost for food waste in the U.S. Uh, I think a, a, a theme that, that we've discussed throughout the, the hearing is that biodiversity conservation programs uh, will work if the agencies responsible for implementation are actually funded. Uh, so it's of utmost importance that we begin to provide the adequate funding uh, to these agencies. Furthermore, um, recognizing that there are multiple priorities uh, with federal funding there are uh, scientific approaches that allow us to make transparent and uh, uh, objective decisions about which species are, are at highest priority to protect, whether this be uh, species that have, have a high chance of recovery or species that are really on the verge of extinction. So also, I think that uh, adopting a prioritization approach to facilitate transparent decisions, employing this return on investment approach can really enhance the outcomes that we're seeing in the US regarding biodiversity conservation. Now, to your question about what do we stand to lose, again, recognizing that uh, there are many competing priorities uh, that, that the federal government is, is faced with, um, you know, uh, I think we've underscored the importance of biodiversity conservation to our economy and our well-being. Um, balancing these priorities, I think it's really important to think about or to recognize that when we lose a species, it's forever. So we can't go back. We can't go back. If we lose a species, that's it. And so I think we need to sort of raise the bar on and how we're currently managing endangered species so that we're adequate, adequately funding these programs given the current crisis that we're faced with. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Just uh, a, a really quick, you can, this can almost be a yes or no answer, but your testimony and others uh, offered today also mentioned the, uh, the importance of collaboration between all levels, levels of government and uh, sh stakeholders. Would you agree, uh, uh, doctor, that uh, robust federal funding helps our natural resources agencies be better partners. Absolutely, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, I, I worked for about five years with the, the service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to develop a prioritization approach to facilitate decision-making around uh, which species 
we should for which species we should implement recovery actions for given limited limited budgets. Uh, as, as we've discussed, um, these agencies are faced with backlogs of candidate species and um, they simply don't have the resources to take the actions or engage in any kind of strategic or prioritization exercises. Um, and so taking this collaborative approach, of course, between the scientific and academic sectors, private sectors and government sectors to try to uh, identify uh, these collaborative and inclusive processes for uh, how we move forward with, with addressing this crisis are absolutely essential. Um, and I, I would like to underscore my, my experience in this project that I just mentioned with uh, working with Fish and Wildlife Service, we, we spent years uh, working on a, an approach called the Recovery Explorer Tool that is now published on, on our website. It's fully available. It allows for transparent decision making. And the agency, Fish and Wildlife Service, is so understaffed that they don't even have the ability to actually take the tool on to use it. And so you know, despite the, the desire of many conservation biologists and agency scientists to work together to solve these problems, the res there are such scarce resources that we're not able to move, move the needle forward. So with additional funding, agencies would have the capacity to actually be ahead of the game in addressing the, this problem as opposed to drinking out of a fire hose, which is the current situation. All right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sullivan, same uh, same uh, uh, series of questions. Would you uh, elaborate on the importance of federal funding for wildlife uh, conservation? And secondly, what do we stand to lose when we underfund these programs? Yes, thank, thank you, you, Senator. Um, Chairman. So I would, I would echo what Dr. Gerber said. Uh, so I'll address the second question first. We stand to lose a lot and it's, and once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, and the consequences are sometimes we don't even understand what the consequences of those losses are. The ecosystem is intertwined. Species are very dependent upon each other. And, uh, you know, to make it even an anthropocentric uh, uh, position is with plants, you know, a lot of the plants uh, uh, could be the future cure for cancer. So when, so when we lose these, they're gone forever. To your uh, first point, I yes, funding is key. Um, I I understand there's a lot of uh, uh, pressures on the Congress to and and the administration and how to allocate resources. I I feel for too long there's uh, there has been a um, lack of investment in nature's infrastructure. Um, I know you. Uh, uh, this committee deals both with the physical built environment as well as the environment, um, you know, the natural environment. And I think there's been an underinvestment in in both areas. So, from from our standpoint, uh, funding for staffing, as as I uh, said uh, in an earlier qu uh, response to a question, is for fish and wildlife is is critical. It's, it's also funding for land acquisitions management. Um, a lot of times management is underfunded. There's, there isn't money to do invasive species management. There isn't money for the restoration programs that some of the speakers have spoke to about today. So uh, funding those things will, will help with uh, hopefully stemming some of the biodiversity loss. From a section uh, six perspective, which helps fund HCPs, we certainly would like more funding in that program, which has been underfunded for decades now for uh, helping uh, HCPs with uh, land acquisitions. There's also a lot that can be done to uh, improve uh, our highway systems for, for wildlife and funding for wildlife crossings, both uh, land bridges and, and um, under crossings. There's examples across the United States and the world. Um, the most famous, and I, I think that a lot of people know about is uh, 
uh, Highway 93 in Montana and Highway 90 going through the Cas Cascades. Uh, there's projects here in uh, looking at doing uh, improvement of wildlife connectivity over Highway 101 in California. There's certainly the examples of Banff up in uh, Canada. So those those are areas where I think when when we're funding infrastructure, it's also how do we fund infrastructure for wildlife? How do we fund uh, you know uh, provide a value for ecosystem services? And um, I think uh, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, I'm I'm in the business of uh, conservation, so obviously I'm asking you for funding for these things, but um, appreciate this opportunity to uh, make this pitch. Thanks, Mr. Sullivan. And uh, Andy, Andy Treehorn. Andy, would, would you please uh, respond to the same two questions I've asked of our, our other witnesses? Would you, and here's the question again, would, would, uh, would you please elaborate on the importance of federal funding for wildlife conservation? And secondly, what do we stand to lose when we underfund these programs? Mr. Thank Treehorn. you, Chairman Carper. Uh, yeah, and I, I think the importance of federal funding uh, is, is wide-ranging, uh, but I also des think it deserves some context. Um, you know, there are a lot of state dollars that go into conservation as well as private sector dollars, uh, but the reality is that the federal government's investments in, in conservation and the environment have not kept track with the growth of the federal government in other areas. Uh, function 300, which is uh, the, the, the baseline for the environment and conservation, outdoor recreation programs and federal budget. Um, you know, it's, I think between 1980 and 2010, uh, overall federal spending grew 130%, uh, but Function 300 grew something like 2.1% during that same time period. Uh, so I think that illustrates uh, some of the challenges we're dealing with and competing priorities that other witnesses have mentioned. Um, you know, in terms of consequences, I, I think there are a lot of consequences. Uh, one is, in, in addition to the ecosystem services and, and the potential loss of those uh, that benefit people, um, I think we, we risk losing a human connection to nature uh, and understanding it. I get that through hunting and fishing. Um, others get it different ways, but uh, it's been part of the nature of human beings for a very long time, and I'm not sure we'll be pleased with the results without it. Um, you know, one other potential consequence, and I can provide an anecdotal example, is one time I was at an event uh, with a state fish and wildlife agency director, and I, I saw him looking at his phone reading emails and um, shaking his head. And I, I asked him what was going on. And he said, we just got our, our section six award for um, you know, the state's portion of endangered species work that we're doing. And he said, they just said we got awarded $1,200. Um, and they had invested significantly more than that uh, in the program. Um, but you know, in addition to the, the lack of resources that were provided uh, pursuant to his work on a federal policy issue, federal trust species, uh, I think that that type of thing also damages the partnerships that many have highlighted uh, so well today. Uh, and the fact that all of these, these folks can come together through these really solid programs uh, that deliver positive results for fish and wildlife uh, the risk of losing that when, when partners aren't contributing at the level they should um, has some pretty severe consequences as well. Ms. Prehorn, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, John Schmidt to respond briefly to the same two questions. I'll again just re repeat them, uh, Mr. Schmidt. Uh, uh, would you elaborate on the importance of federal funding for wildlife conservation? And secondly, what do we stand to lose when we underfund these programs? I'm, I'm, I'm running out of time. Uh, but I, I want, want to hear from you just briefly on those two questions. The importance of federal funding for wildlife conservation, what do we stand to lose when we underfund these programs? Go, go right ahead, Mr. Thank, Thank you, Chairman, Chairman Carper. Uh, I'll make it short. The, um, the, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, and part of that environment is fish and wildlife resources and all the non-game species 
that depend on them for their food and, and, and for the rest of us for our enjoyment. So that would answer your short answer to your number one. The second part is what we lose is opportunity. We lose opportunity to, to work with folks that own the vast majority of, of the habitat we wish to make better. So, you know, we don't have that. If we don't have adequate funding, we, we lose the opportunity to save species, to protect habitat, and to help private landowners uh, do good things with their land, which helps our communities. Thank you, sir. One, the one last question I have, and I think, um, I think it was uh, Mr. Sullivan may have commented on, on that in the issue of wildlife crossings. I'm going to ask uh, um, Andy Treehorn if, if he would to, to comment on this as, as well. And, uh, and I think in your testimony, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned the importance of, of habitat connectivity and you expressed support for wildlife crossing provisions uh, that this committee reported unanimously as part of the uh, transportation bill report, report out in the last Congress. And that, I think that was the first time ever in a highway bill we included uh, such comprehensive language to, to uh, address what a number of believe as an important issue. So, Mr. Treehorn, uh, uh, briefly, would, would you elaborate on the importance of addressing wildlife vehicle safety and habitat connectivity, and specifically the importance of integrating these solutions throughout a highway bill, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman Carper. Um, you know, the, the reality is that, uh, as I said in my testimony in my opening remarks, there are about two million uh, vehicle collisions with large animals across the country uh, each year. This is not only a, a human safety issue, but um, there's also a cost to taking those animals off the landscape, uh, whether it's because you like to, to look at them or for biodiversity, um, or because somebody would have otherwise purchased a hunter, hunting license and harvested one to feed their family. Um, but it's, it's a public safety issue, and uh, with some of the emerging challenges we're facing, wildlife needs to be able to move, uh, especially migrating wildlife. Um, you know, one, one of the, the pleasures I've had in my life was serving on the Habitat Stamp Committee for the state of Colorado, uh, which directed funding to some projects. And uh, some of, there was, during that time, there was some uh, wildlife crossing work going on on Highway 9. Um, large animal collisions were something like 35% of all reported crash types on that highway. Uh, it's up in the, in the mountains at a higher elevation. Um, very dangerous. Uh, and, you know, sportsmen and women uh, chipped in a lot through their support of the State Fish and Wildlife Agency, uh, working with CDOT to, to develop that project. Uh, it's had a 90% reduction in wildlife vehicle collisions. Other species are using it, uh, mule deer, elk, turkeys, mountain lions, coyotes, river otters. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity to build this infrastructure and incorporate it into uh, larger, larger programming um, and, and existing programming, too. Um, you know, things like the Federal Lands Transportation Program, Federal Lands Access Program, um, uh, as I mentioned in my testimony, Section 1125 from ATIA. Um, those are all great things that, that can be helpful for biodiversity as well as public safety in a highway bill. Thanks uh, for, uh, for your report to, uh, report to, uh, response to that question, uh, Andy. Uh, again, uh, give uh, our best regards if you come across uh, Dr. Wayne Allard, uh, also former Senator Wayne Allard. Give him our best tones. His friends uh, here in the, co in the Congress, Democrats, Republicans alike, send, send their best to him. I, um, I really want to thank uh, Dr. Gerber. I want to thank uh, the real Ed Sullivan and uh, Andy Treh Trehorn and John Schmidt for joining us uh, t today. And, uh, I, we may have some follow-up questions for the records, but uh, and if we if we uh, if you do receive those, I really ask that you respond to them. Uh, but uh, this been um, it's been a good hearing. Uh, over half of our, our committee, I think, has joined us either uh, in person or or virtually, and we'll I'm sure have some follow-up questions, and we'd ask that you respond to them uh, as 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 soon as you uh, uh, can. Uh, in my opening statement, I talked about just how high the stakes are when it comes to biodiversity loss. It bears repeating again. Uh, we have a moral as well as an existential imperative to come together and take action on this vital issue. It's no uh, overstatement to say that our lives and our livelihoods and those of our children and their children hang in the balance. So I am proud that we've been able to meet uh, today to examine 
how we might tackle this critical problem. I'm hopeful that today's uh, concentration is not the end, uh, but the beginning of our work together, this Congress, as we build further on a committee's reputation as an effective bipartisan uh, uh, committee of workhorses. You know, you've all heard the term show horses, so we like to think of ourselves in this committee as a workhorse, and I believe we are. Um, a couple of uh, closing uh, housekeeping items. I would ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the following written uh, testimonies, letters, and statements, as well as other supplemental materials relevant to our uh, today's um, hearing topic. They include a statement from Dr. Thomas Lovejoy and Dr. Lee Hanna, also a written testimony from Dr. Gabriela uh, Chavaria uh, about pollinator loss, and a letter from World Wildlife uh, Fund about how the Big Cat Public Safety Act addresses biodiversity uh, challenges. Is there uh, objection? Hearing none, so ordered. Uh, senators will be allowed to submit questions uh, to our, uh, our witnesses for the record through close of business on June the 2nd. We will compile those questions and we'll send them on to our witnesses. We ask our witnesses to reply by June the, uh, the 16th. And my script here says that, that I'm supposed at this point to say the hearing is adjourned. But I, um, I'm not quite ready to do that. A very clever staff, probably with some input from our Republican friends, has, uh, at my request, looked to see if there's anything in song that uh, relates to, uh, to the, today's hearing. I mentioned um, uh, to, to the real Ed Sullivan, who's one of our witnesses today, Edwin Sullivan. Uh, I asked my staff to take a look at the, one of the folks who, uh, one of the groups was on the, uh, the, uh, the Ed Sullivan show uh, when I was in college, I think. And uh, the, uh, the beetles, when that's, there's, a, there's a species to themselves of some interest in, to all of us. Uh, the ladybug is a state bug from Delaware, by the way. But I, I asked my staff to take a look and see uh, anything in the beetles repertoire that reflects uh, biodiversity. As it turns out, remarkably, there's, a, there's more than a few songs. Um, I mentioned one of them, I'm the walrus. Another one is blackbird, blackbird singing in the dead of night. Norwegian wood, isn't it good? Norwegian man, your bird can sing. Blue jay way, rocky raccoon, mother nature's son. Everybody's got something to hide except for me and my monkey. Octopus's garden, and uh, the play. Uh, the list goes on. For some of us of my generation, our children, that is a playlist of my life. And uh, the uh, with respect to life, uh, if we don't uh, look after, if we don't focus on biodiversity and uh, root causes of the threat to biodiversity. Uh, our lives are, I, I don't mean to be overly dramatic, but our lives and those the, the lives of the people we care about uh, are threatened. And we can and, uh, do something about it, and I'm encouraged in this committee, we're committed to doing that. And with that, I think this uh, hearing is adjourned. My thanks to everyone who's participated. I want to thank our Republican colleagues over here on my right, and the uh, Democratic staff, the majority staff, but directly behind me, everybody that's worked on uh, this hearing today, and for those of you as witnesses who joined us in person and from afar, uh, thank you very much. Good luck. God bless. See you soon. And with that, this hearing is adjourned.